Okay, I guess it's two o'clock. I'm gonna get started. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending this the last day in the afternoon session after lunch. So uh, it's always tough to present in this time slot, but uh, happy to see a few of you who can make it and uh, come over here to to listen to this tutorial. So just do a quick introduction of myself. My name is Dion Leung. I work for BTI Systems. Um, I'm going to do a quick one-minute uh, intro uh, on the company, but and then the, for the rest of the presentation, it's not going to be BTI related, okay? Um, because the the objective of this tutorial is, is meant to be uh, a tutorial for for someone uh, who have not done any optical uh, engineering, optical networking, and this is how I put together this presentation. So if the material is too easy for you, I apologize. I cannot make a presentation that please everybody, but the intent here is to make sure that uh, when you get out of the room, I hope hopefully every one of you uh, who come for a reason would able to uh, take something away, okay? Without further ado, I'm gonna go uh, to my next slide. So uh, again, BTI systems, uh, some of you may have not had a chance to visit our booth, just right outside, so right after this conference, if you have any other questions about BTI specific products, about our optical packet networking products, come stop by and talk to me, talk to our other representatives. We're more than happy to, to tell you more about the company. But right now, just one slide, just want to show you that uh, BTI is a Canadian-based company. We manufacture uh, packet optical products and we have customers, publicly announced customer in Asia Pacific, you know, for example, like Equinix, uh, PacNet, um, these are our, our customer who have been using our product for data center interconnections. And obviously we also have customer in the service provider space that deployed our Metro E solution, WDM solutions, okay? Again, I'm not gonna talk about too much on this. This is not the intent. So, understand again, this is after lunch. I'm gonna make it somewhat interactive. I'm gonna walk around. I, uh, Talk to George. Yeah. Before that, I'm, I said, you know, it's videotape, right? I've never been videotape before, but I'm going to walk around. I'm going to make some challenging tasks for you. Um, try to keep it more, more fun, okay? So let's do a show of hands so that I get an idea. I always love two, interactive uh, two-way presentation. How many of you here actually have done optical link engineering or have designed optical networks? Okay. So I'm sorry for you guys, you may find this presentation a little bit too easy. If there's anything that I can help you after this presentation or if you happen to fall, fall asleep, I'm not gonna wake you up because you know this stuff already. Yeah. The, uh, like, like I said, this presentation was designed to really uh, uh, someone who have not or very little knowledge about optical networking, but uh, hopefully you can maybe pick a few things from this too. And uh, Another question, I guess this question is more for the provider side or from the, uh, uh, anybody that, that provides services. How many of you here actually also have been considering leasing wavelengths or multiple wavelengths for providing connectivities? Okay, one, thank you. What about here, dark fiber? or sometimes now it's going, in some other regions, it's even called gray fiber. How many of you have designed, you know, have, have planned to do this? Excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. So, assuming that we have most of the people here coming from the IP, more of IP data networking background, uh, I would just like to level set. Uh, for those of you who have not, not been dealing with optical networking, most of the time when you're dealing with data networking, the router, the MPOS switches, or router, or you know, layer two and above, this is usually what you see. Usually, right, you see a big cloud, you have the edge device, you have the uh, CE, the uh, customer premise device, and then you have the core, kind of the P router, or the uh, provider, provider edge, or sometimes we call edge, or you know, a core uh, 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 demarcation. And, Typically, right, this can be across countries, right? So you don't necessarily need to know or care about the underlying physical infrastructure. Yeah, so all you care is logical connectivity, 
The underlying physical infrastructure is sometimes not so important for you to know as long as you give me a 10 gig in the face, as long as you know you have a 40 gig or 100 gig in the face, I don't care how it's being run. I'm not saying, obviously, depending on the application, you do care sometimes as well. But this is what you see, let's say, of a textbook from uh, Juniper or from Cisco. For optical networking, however, yeah, the physical route, the physical actual fiber map is an important element of the, any optical link or optical networking engineering. Yeah. So what you see here, what is important from any optical networking design is that we always need to know that uh, how the actual underlying topology is being connected. Yeah. You need to know the fiber distance, you need to know the fiber characteristics, and, and, and to, for, for, you know, to design an optical network, these are the mandatory thing that all, one always need to know. If you plan, assuming you're planning for an optical networking, uh, optical networks or optical links, or where there's a ring type topology, where there's a mesh type topology, where there's a point-to-point -point link, or multiple point-to-point -point links. Yeah, this is always an important consideration. So, with that said, I'm going to start something very basic. I'm going to walk you through how an optical network, first is link and network, can be designed. Okay, so the, of the bulk of my presentation, I'm going to look at more of a physics point of view, not to the point that's like physics, physics, but the physical engineering point of view, and also from a networking point of view, so that you also see the big picture. Uh, about, a little bit about my background as well. I have the fortunate to be an opportunity to design neural networks uh, in, in this field, uh, whether it's in the US, whether when I work in North America or in Asia Pacific, I have had the opportunity to design a lot of networks uh, for the tier ones, for example, like Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, and then in Asia Pac in, in, uh, in, and so forth. So this is just, a, I would like to start something basic, which is a point-to-point -point link, yeah? So two can in a string. Everybody can understand that. Yeah. So now this, I will start from this. Like any optical networking, as I mentioned before, you need to know the fiber. Okay? This is the one thing that you always knew, because after all, we are dealing with fiber optic networks. So the condition of the fiber, the length of the fiber, the characteristic of the fiber, is always preferred you need to know that you have obtained the information before you start design any optical engineering network or links. So for example, the length, obviously you need to know the distance. Is it going to be from rack to rack within a data center? Is it going to be a data center to data center? In the case for just say, for example, TY1 and TY2, yeah? Or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, SG1, SG2, for example, just give me one, one example from data center to data center. Or is it going to be between uh, city to cities? Okay, so this is something that, that you would first would need to know the fiber distance, the fiber topology map, so that you, 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 you need to get that information to, for the design. Second, how many uh, fiber strength do you have? From the extreme case, I run into vendors or service provider, they only lease or buy uh, fiber one string at a time. Okay, so not fiber pair, but one, okay? And they want to do high capacity transmission over a single fiber strand. Yeah, I've run into that, you know, for a very low cost provider, they like to do that. They don't know whether the business case can justify the whole thing or not, okay? Um, or do you also get, would you get multiple fibers in the case in sometimes in North America, some of the provider, they are so fiber rich that they have multiple fiber. In that case, you might not even need WDM. Right? Because each fiber pair, you can actually put 10 gig of capacity, 100 gig capacity, and that might be enough. Right? Where dark fiber is so cheap to get or so abundant between, you know, some location or some country or some cities. Right? And I said, you know, there are also the extreme case, only one fiber strength. So you have to ask yourself, okay, after you understand the conductivity from this point and to this point, how many fiber can you get, can you lease, can you rent, can you borrow, whatever, yeah. Third thing is the type of the, fi of the fiber, yeah. So 
Obviously, um, if, if you're talking about metro or regional or long haul network, meaning spanning you know, hundreds of kilometers to thousands of kilometers, very likely, in, in fact, I would say all of the case is going to be single mode fiber. Yeah? This is the type of fiber that is used for long distance transmission, whereas the multi mode fiber is more like across shelf, between racks type. Right? So you have to know the type of fiber. Yeah? And also, also, there are also multiple fiber types as well. For example, if you say G.652, this is like a st standard. Uh, uh, most of the time, you run into single mole fiber or Corning uh, SMF28. This is a frequently used fiber being deployed uh, in many of the regions. Or in the case for in, in here in Japan, we do run into some fiber that's using G653, which are DSF fiber. It's quite challenging, right, in the ways how you design that link, okay? There's some tactics, some techniques that you can actually still put terabit of capacity easily with C-band equipment over DSF fiber. So again, depending on the distance, depending on the condition of fiber, but you have to know the fiber type, yeah? I'm gonna talk about the fiber type a little bit later. And then there's also the, uh, for some leaf fiber, there's G.655, similar to this, but with a different dispersion uh, uh, map. So again, just a quick overview, right? You need to know the distance, you need to know how many you've got, and you have to know the type of fiber you're, you're getting. So was that good? Next, what else? The condition of the fiber. Yeah. What I mean by that, just using the analogy, the two cannon string, if the string have a lot of knock, knot in it, that means that, you know, the fiber maybe have a lot of connections, have a lot of spikes, a lot of maybe air gaps, maybe it's aging due to aging, due to microband factor, right? It affects your overall loss between point A and point B. And why do we care about this? Why do you care about high loss fiber, so what? Why do you, ever, why do you even, even care about this? Because the loss is directly proportional, will affect your cost for amplifying that link. An amplifier, it costs. You have to buy more extra equipment to be able to transmit from point A to point B if the loss is too high. Okay? So that's why you need to know, okay, and also, other than aging, is it underground? Is it going to be along the coast? Is it going to be aerial fiber? I, I, I get, I've been fortunate enough to design all this type of fiber network before. Yeah, they all have imposed some sort of challenge as well. But you also need to know how the fiber, because in Myanmar, the fiber is very different from, from the fiber in Japan, very different from the fiber in India, very different from the fiber in, in, in Illinois, Chicago. Okay? So, so you have to you understand uh, the, the, this as well. Last but not least, is your expectation on the bandwidth that you're going to transport over this fiber link. Yeah? Do you need 10 gig? Do you need 100 gig? Do you need multiple 100 gig? Do you need multiple 200 gig wavelengths? That is something that you need to know, you know uh, to what I call end of life, which basically the, the, the overall the life cycle of your network. What's your expectation, right? Because depending on the capacity that you need, vendors like BTI or whoever, right, will have to design the network accordingly. We'll pick different Lego blocks, okay, and to put together a design for you. You want to optimize for the first cost? Okay, that's one approach. You want to optimize for the flexibility? Okay, that's one approach, right? So for, we have, for me, I deal with the spectrum of customers to the single fiber strength, they only want maybe eight channels of 10 gig. Two, day one, you know what, Dion, I want 96 channel, 100 gig, day one, no question asked. I know I'm gonna use that capacity. I know that I, I will grow with that. In fact, you have to tell me if this platform can upgrade it to 200 gig per wavelength as well. So, from the, so you can see there's a whole spectrum of requirements. So this is also very, very important to know beforehand. All I'm trying to say today, especially in this particular conference, I can clearly tell you that terabit link capacity in the metro space is definitely not uncommon anymore. Yeah? So some of our customers, they actually buy, okay, give me 500 gig between these two sides. Give me 600 gig between these two sides. It's very, very not uncommon. It's very common, in other words. Um, especially in the DCI connection 
perspective, data center interconnection perspective. Yeah. Okay, so uh, after that, you have a very good uh, uh, the ideas about hopefully you, you convinced that you need to know the fiber, what information that you need. Now I'm going to talk, talk to you about one, one by one about the fiber itself, right? So fiber, one of the key things about fiber is attenuation. That means the fiber loss. So you can see some animation here. As you have a fiber that launched from point A to point B, the power, after all coming from the laser, will reduce the power due to the scattering of the light. Yeah. Due to the loss, so when you travel a distance, the power, the, the power of the signal degrade or get less or reduce. So depending on the condition of fiber, as I said, right? So depending on the length, okay, you could run into fiber that is as good as 0.2 dB per kilometer. If it's like a brand new that lay on the ground or even 0.18, I've seen it. Or all the way up to 0.5 dB per kilometer. I've seen that as well, right? Really bad fiber, maybe aging, maybe a lot of connectors. So when you average out the length, the loss over the length, 0.5 dB is not unheard of. 0.6, I've even done 0.6 before. Yeah. And from a link engineering perspective, all you need, the number one basic is, when I launch it at some power level, when I go across the signal to go to somewhere lower level, can I, my receiver, so I transmit, I receive, can I receive the power? Yeah, because over the fiber length, you get loss. Where there's a fiber loss, space loss, connector loss, and you may want to, some, to add some kind of safety margin just in case, right? For the aging, because after all, most of the transport network lasts for five, 10, 15 years, right? So you have to take that into account. Can you receive that power? Yeah, I have an, uh, some example later. On top of that, right, you, one other concept that's important to know is the concept of transmission window. Yeah? When you're dealing with today, I'm pretty sure every one of you know the SFP, XFP, all the pluggables, right? And it, you have different numbers on it. Right? You have 850, you have 1310, you have 1550. This is referred to the band, the transmission window that falls into. And each transmission window, obviously because of the fiber, it has a different loss profile. Give an example, in the case of a multimode fiber range, 850, the loss is roughly about 1 dB per kilometer. Okay, it's high lossy, cheaper, but a high lossy environment. For long transmission, obviously you want to take the advantage of window that give you the most, or should, I should say, the least loss as possible so that you can transmit your power, your signal as far as possible, right? That's where the WDM came from. It came from the long haul, the subsea guys, right? To invent this. How can I maximizing my transmission distance over my limited fibers, yeah? So, so that's where we call the C-band, okay? And then this is, Usually, this is the band that you're dealing with, okay? And that's because, the reason why, because it gives you the least loss per kilometers, okay? That means for the same amount of amplifying cost, I can go the furthest, okay? So, so again, when you receive, let's say you lease a dark fiber or you own a dark fiber, you, when you receive the specs, or the, 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 the um, requirements from the provider, you need to know at 1550, what kind of loss profile do I have? At 1310, what kind of loss, loss profile do I, do, you know, do I get? Okay? After that, now we, we kind of talk about the fiber. Now let's talk about the Lego blocks to build the point to point link. Yeah? So you need a block called transponder or maxponder with a transceiver. You need what we call a passive mux dmux, sometimes it's called MD or mux dmux. Usually passive, require no power. I'm going to go into one, each element one at a time, right? And then you need one and two because you need the, the two endpoints, right? You try to do the transmission from point A to point B. 
so that you basically it's more like a mirror image of the two, and that's how you create an optical link. Transponder, I am um, you know for those of you who have done it, it is really basic stuff. It's just a matter of turning gray to color. This is the easy way to remember it, right? Gray meaning that you give me a 10 gig, for example, land file, you give me an STM64. It's not the wavelength, right? In the optical networking term, we call it this gray optics. It's not colored. Versus the colored, it tied to a wavelength. Okay, you tune to a wavelength of so channel one, two, three, four, five, or whatever wavelengths, right? Could be DWDM wavelength, could be CWDM wavelength. And it's, there's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you're 10 gig in, 10 gig wavelength out. 100 gig in, 100 gig wavelength out. Very simple. There's also a term called Max Bonder, multiplexing transponder. People call it Max Bonder. Yeah, then that allows you to multiplex a lot of sub 10 gig rate. In this case, there's also Max Bonder in two and a half gig. There's also Max Bonder in 100 gig. I just use 10 gig, for example, right? This is the most commonly used rate still today, right? Despite the hype of the 100 gig, um, 10 gig is by far still is the most dominant uh, transmission uh, uh, interface. So in here, what I'm showing the max point is you're multiplexing some low speed rate as long as the total is less than 10 gig. I'm gonna put it, multiplexing it, multiplexing all these low rates in, onto a 10 gig wavelengths. Okay? Next thing is the transceiver, right? Those are the pluggables. So today we, uh, we have all kinds of transceivers from uh, two and a half gig, one gig, 10 gig, you know, multi-rate, 100 gig. And they have different names, right? So you have the SFP, the XFP, the QSFP, CFP. By the way, do you, any of, does anyone know why CFP is C for 100 gig? Questions? I know people is uh, going to have lunch. After lunch is tough. YC, C stands for what? Anybody knows? You got a gift? Huh? Thank you. Centennial. So it's, like, it's a Roman letter. X stand 10, right? Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Right? So C is 100. So that's 100 gig. Yeah? So from time to time, I'm going to ask some questions. I know it's getting uh, tough after lunch. So, and then you have different uh, uh, wavelengths as well, yeah? So usually, for all the transceiver, right, you will have a specs. The one key thing that you always look at from the specs is the dynamic range, yeah? How much can you transmit and how much, how low can you receive? Or how high can you transmit, how low can you receive? Because that defines your power budget. If you remember that I talk about the fiber loss, you launch at a high, due to loss, your signal reduce, and then you, you want to know how low can you receive it, right? So that's kind of, the, there's a range that you have to be f within that range so that you can be properly receive the signal at the far end. Okay, so now we've talked about mux ponder, transponder, transceiver. Next component, the mux demux. Yeah. Mux demux, you can think of, it's more like a, a prism, yeah? You, sh you know, as a kid, right, I still like into the, the little triangle, and the triangle is spread out all different colors. Yeah, logically, it's like that, right? So you have multiple. The other way is that you know applies the same. The logic applies. You have multiple wavelengths with different colors, wavelengths, frequency. Then you multiplexing onto a pair of fiber, and then on the other end, you demux it. You de multiplex it so that you can get each individual wavelength. So this is the mux demux. Just like, you know, WDM is very, is, the concept is it's just one kind of frequency division multiplexing, right? Just like FM, right? Air, in this case, is a common medium. For fiber optic, the fiber is a common medium, but you're combining multiple wavelengths or multiple frequency over the same medium. So that is the mux demux. So in the market, Again, this is non-BTI, but you will find that a lot of MUX DMUX comes with different size. Some can combine more channels, some can combine less. Typically today, you know, 96 channels is, is a fair common to be deployed, that you can have uh, 96 different lengths or different highway lengths that you can multiplex your car 
onto this highway link onto a pair of fiber. Yeah. So uh, there's different type of uh, technologies to create this MUX DMUX. This is not important to discuss here, but the point is uh, most, if not all, today of the uh, MUX DMUX, they are, these are passive device, meaning that it requires no power. It's not an active device. Yeah. It's just a matter of virtually divided your fiber pair into multiple links. That's, that's all it does. Okay? And one link can be 10 gig, one link can be 100 gig, one link can be 40 gig. So it depends on the specific render implementations. Yeah. Okay, so for point to point link, I'm using a Tokyo for example. I got this from, uh, well, I know this site as well. Uh, it's a point to point, right? So point to point link is fairly straightforward to design, but I want to give you an idea now. I'm not talking about the components view anymore. I'm talking about the network engineering view now that if you want to design a network, let's say this data center one to data center two, 40 kilometers, 10 dB, sorry, I need to walk because I cannot stand there for too long. Um, and I want to put capacities of, let's say, 200 gig or 20, 10 gig. Yeah? So what kind of device do you need? Let's say you have never done optical networking engineering before, never designed optical network before, and I'm gonna show you what you need. Yeah? I put a little logo there because I'm not allowed to advertise, so, you see, I forgot. <laughs> um, for this particular link, right, you have a max DMAX, and then you have a transponder, yeah? Doesn't matter what it looks like, right? So you need a max DMAX, allow me to combine multiple wavelengths, and then I have a trans my transponder with pluggable transceiver. Let's say I'm plugging in 20, 10, so I will have 20, I'll fill up 20 client gray optics, 20 color optics, and I'm gonna put into one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm gonna use 20 ports on this guy. That's it. Cannot get easier than that. That's how you engineer a link, point to point link like this. Oh, question. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah, absolutely. The question is can you have a, a box, let's say not a transponder, just like a color optics? Yeah, in a switch, which happens in, in a, now they all, all make that too. A lot of the switching company now have their own color optics, right? Obviously, you have to check the specs, right? If the spec works, in most cases, I'm gonna say, oh, most cases, you can use this mux to mux, and then you, you can take your switch, your color optics, plug into here, and then it can transmit as well. It doesn't have to be a transponder if you already have the color optics in your switch, okay? Or, if you want 100 gig, I can also multiplex 1010 onto my 100 gig wavelengths, go here, 1010, second wavelengths, go here. I'm gonna use two port of this 40 port mux to mux. Just an example, yeah. There's many other ways to design it. I'm just using this as a simple example to illustrate. You can, that's how you provide a 200 gig link between the two sites. So far so good? All right, so now as I mentioned, right, uh, we, the first thing you always need to know is the power budget. Does it, is it even enough? In other words, do you need some kind of amplification if the loss is too high? So to do the calculation is pretty straightforward. You get the transmit, judge the, the spec from the transceiver on the uh, transmit side. There's some loss. It's a passive device, but there's some insertion loss in here. So you take it, take the, the, the power, the launch power, minus the loss of this max dmax, minus the loss for 10 dB. 10 come from 40 times, oh sorry, 40 times 0.25 or divide by four. That gives you 10 dB, this link, yeah? So that's 10 dB for the on the fiber. There's also some loss here, and then your receiver end, right? That's part of the spec of your dynamic range of the specs on the transceiver. Can you actually get it, right? So in this case, just very simple, simplified calculation, but the idea is the same. You want to know after you transmit, after loss, can you receive it, okay? So, okay, then you do the transmit, minus the loss, minus the fiber loss, minus the max loss, and some safety margin. In this case, I'm using three. For point to point, three probably overkill. It would be two, sometimes even one if you want to go aggressive. 
but usually you have some kind of safety margin as well. So in this case, my launch is at zero, minus five, minus 10, minus five, minus three, 23, ah, okay. So this is not the only test, but this is the essential test you always, if that fails, your link won't work, period, okay? You just don't have enough power, or the loss is simply too high that you cannot make it work, okay? Unless you have, obviously, if you add amplifier, then of course you can make it work, but in this case, assuming there's no amplifier, especially, uh, you mentioned the case for if you have a color optics in your switch that you don't have an amplifier, this is how you do the test. So, so far so good for a point to point link. Yeah. Ooh. But oh, this animation, well, what I'm trying to show is the three link connect them together. Okay. So instead of point to point, now what about I have a four node three link network. How can I go about designing that link? Before I can do that, I would like to show you more Lego blocks. Okay. First of all, okay, before the Lego blocks, my partner, right? To design a point, multi-point or multi-span or multi-node links, one approach you would put a transponder here, a transponder here, or sometimes for the function of repeating the signal or regenerating signal or regen. Here, that's how you make a longer, larger networks. Yeah. So if you have multiple wavelengths, you have same thing. You add more and more. So basically you stop at every hop, just like the metro train system in, in, in here in Tokyo, right? So you stopped, it's not an express train, it's not a limit express, you stop, and you stop, you stop at every single hop, okay? Expensive, but it works, right? As long as every link works, right? Or more, 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 more company is the amplifying approach, meaning that you're not gonna pay all this. Instead, you're gonna combine them and put it into an optical amplifier that allows you to amplify all wavelengths at once. Again, optical amplifier allows to amplify all wavelengths at once. So you put one, two, three, four amplifier instead of that many cards. And it adds up. If you have more wavelengths, this approach adds up. Right? As you can see, you have to buy more and more repeater or regenerator. Okay? So it depends on the overall economics. If you have only a few wavelengths, that approach is okay, right? It gets the job done. But if you have a lot of wavelengths, the amplifier is more cost effective, right? Assuming you don't need to terminate the traffic at the individual sites. You just want to terminate traffic at the endpoints. Okay. So, optical amplifier is another Lego block that is in your toolbox that you can use for designing optical networks. One other thing that I'm gonna talk about is also DCM or DCF, this dispersion compensation module. It's also a very commonly used Lego blocks for design optical networks. I don't care which vendor, uh, true optical vendors will have amplifier and also have DCM as well in the portfolio. Okay. Yes. Not really. No. Yeah. Optical amplifier, most of the case, for in a DWM range. Yeah. So. In the F, uh, FD, uh, EDFA stand for Erbium Dog, uh, uh, dog, Erbium dog uh, fi Fiber uh, Amplifier. Um, basically, there's two kinds. There's two kinds of amplifier in the market. Okay, if you're dealing with a lot of metro networks, the EDFA amplifier is the only amplifier that you will usually see. Yeah, this is the by far the most common amplifier. Is plug in as a, it's also in a module factor that plug into your chassis or your shelf, and it gives you a fixed gain or variable gain, and it's easiest to deploy. Okay, just like audio amplifier, any audio file here, right? You have amplifier, you have different kinds of range, you have dynamic range, you have you have a different gain profile. Similar ideas. It's just an amplifier, right? Allows you to amplify a weak signal to a stronger signal. There's another type of amplifier called Raman amplifier. Yeah, this is usually you see this type of amplifier in more of a cross country or let's say pan Malaysia networks or a long length, thousands of kilometers or a single high lossy span. Let's say you want to do a 45 dB span. 
this is where you see that you may have to use a Raman amplifier. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a little bit of this. Trickier to deploy, high power, but it's always used in conjunction with the EDFA. Okay, so just a little bit of fun fun fact: What's inside EDFA? You may only need to know it once, and you don't ever need to know it again. So. Amplifier is made of use, using there's a pump laser. What's inside the amplifier is allow you to pump, okay, the power that so the signal coming from this input, yeah, and then you have a pump laser that's working in a different wavelength of your actual signal. You couple them together into the erbium dope fiber. So there's a little bit of fiber in the amplifier itself that the pump laser will get this fiber excited. Yeah, put this fiber into more of a high energy state, so that when you combine with the incoming signal, the incoming signal get the emission, and that that's how you amplify the signal at the output. Okay, so this is I'm showing a one stage amplifier. There are the amplifier that have two stage, meaning not only one pump but two pump. Okay, that's also. There's a lot of you know, two pumps uh, uh, amplifier in the market as well. So that usually give you a higher gain. Yeah, for a single stage, usually give you less gain. Um, and remember, I talk about the transmission window. Obviously, in different band, there's also different type amplifier. In the case of C band, there's a C band amplifier. In the case of L band, there's usually there's an L band. L band amplifier tends to be more expensive, generally speaking just because of the supply and demand. Yeah, most of the deployment in the world is C-band, but not so much on the L-band. Yeah. And for Raman amplifier, I don't have the details here. All I'm saying is that the, 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 the idea is the same. The only challenge for Raman amplifier is that for the medium, remember I talked about the pump, pump into the medium, get the medium excited. The Raman amplifier, the medium, is the fiber itself on the ground. So if you have the fiber on the ground, you want to get a portion of the fiber excited. If there's a very bad fiber, a lot of connector or spice, it's not going to work. The Raman amplifier is either it's not going to work, either you're going to burn your fiber or you're going to get a very little gain out of that high power Raman amplifier. It is tricky because the condition on the fiber on the ground before the receiver side, so let's say uh, you know, two kilometers, uh, I mean, in uh, 800 meters away from the receiver side, the, 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 the quality of the fiber is important to make the Raman amplifier work. So, so that's why it's very tricky to deploy because it's not just like a module based amplifier like EDFA. The Raman amplifier requires a portion of your fiber, your outside plant fiber, to make that work. So, if you have poor quality fiber, most likely the RAM amplifier is not going to work. Or it doesn't give you the guaranteed performance that the spec will tell you. Okay, so I'll just leave it as it, yeah. Um, next Lego block is DCM, Dispersion Compensation Modules. I'll make a note here. Uh, uh, okay, let me show you what, 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 what do you mean by chromatic dispersion, yeah. Just like fiber loss, it's part of the characteristic of the fiber. Chromatic dispersion basically tells you that if you have multiple wavelengths, as they travel through the fiber because of the reflective index, because of the, the dif different wavelengths, it have different uh, 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 wavelength or frequency, when they travel from point A to point B, okay, some wavelength it will be travel faster than the others. So what happens is that when you're at the receiver end, Right? Some signal can actually overlap each other so that it's hard for the receiver to recover the signal. Okay? So this one I'm showing the same idea but in a different form. Right? So you have, let's say, a wave, okay, have multiple different components. When you're going through the fiber, okay, this basically the signal is spread out okay, over, over the distance. How DCM works is actually another piece of fiber, right? This is a positive, uh, positive slope dispersion. I'm not getting the detail, but it's kind of like counter act, okay? 
One is positive slope, one is negative slope. It's different type of fiber that allows you to recover your signal at the far end. Okay. So let me show you the next slide. I think it's easier. So in a, in a, in a, in a network, what happens is that, let's say you're going to travel just like what I show you over four times 60 kilometers, uh, let's say 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers. This is where you will put the DCM at each span. Yeah? So that when the dispersion is going to go almost out of specs, you're using the DCM to decrease the chromatic dispersion. Increase, decrease, increase, and decrease. Yes, question. Passive device also. Yeah. Most of the time. There, some vendors have decided to make it active as well to add more intelligence to it. But most, in most cases, are usually it's passive. So, so then that's how you do the, 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 the dispersion compensation over a multiple link networks. Okay? And in the, again, it's just not, 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 not only BTI, most vendors will categorize the DCM into kilometers. Yeah? And there are different types of DCM for different fiber type, as I mentioned earlier. There's SMF fiber type, there's a positive slope fiber type for 655, 652, 653. And the DCM will usually classify in kilometers. Okay? So you just, it's a matter of matching. If this is a 45 kilometers link, you put a 40 kilometer DCM or 50, doesn't matter. That's because after all, your receiver has some tolerance. So it's not like as tight. It doesn't have to be exact. So you can always run up or run down or truncate, you know, whatever you call it. Right? You, you, that's how you pick the right DCM over a long link. And obviously, most of the cases, if you design a link, you always will have some kind of planning tool, design tool, that helps you to verify not only for one wavelength, but for my 80 wavelength, 96 wavelength, 40 wavelength, they're all kind of still within that tolerance. Okay, question time. Yes? Other? Ah, good idea. I have been thought about, I have thought about that for quite some time actually. Today, none, unfortunately. And definitely not like across multi vendors. Uh, come talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, yeah we, we, we can talk. Yeah. I don't think there's any. I, I, I mean, let's, let's, short answer I have never come across any like a open source uh, spreadsheets that, that can do that job. But, yeah. um, okay, so I mentioned a few things. Now, question time. I have to give you a ball because you asked me a few questions already. Okay. Four, building uh, optical networks. What are the Lego blocks that I've mentioned about? Anybody? Volunteer? I'll start the first one. That one doesn't count actually, fiber pair. What elements have I mentioned over the past 45 minutes? Come on, don't be shy. It's a very cool bouncy ball. Come on, come on, I need some love, come on. Thank you. It's actually on the next night, but yeah, you got it. What else? What Lego blocks? Thank you. That counts too. Anything else? Seriously? It's already there. Sorry. That doesn't count. What are the Lego blocks? I just mentioned a few of the... <laughs> Amb oh, yeah, Amb oh, okay. You want one? <laughs> what else? The one that I just showed? Yes, who, hey, who said it? Who, who? Catch him. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. So that's very helpful. I have to keep excited. I know it's after lunch, sorry. I, sorry for you guys to come into here. Max D Max, DCM, amplifier, and then transponder, Max Bonder, thank you. And transceiver also, right? The pluggables. It's also part of the Lego blocks. Okay? So when you talk to any optical vendor, hopefully it's PTI, these are the Lego blocks that you get. That's how that, when you okay, you say, you know, vendor X quote, this is the component that you will see. Okay. Now, let's get to one last Lego block that I would like to show you. This is uh is 
uh, be use, useful when you have a network like so. Okay? Not only point to point, not only, only a, 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 a linear network, but now it's more, getting more, a little bit more interesting. Yeah? You can say this is a mesh network, you can say this is a ring network, whatever you call it, it's getting more complicated. This is how you do the engineering. And I'll show you why. I will still use the point-to-point -point example, okay? Point A, point C, I've talked about it. You guys have gave me the right answer, right? What Lego blocks do you need? You can engineer this link on your own, on a piece of paper now. You can actually write down what, what you need, I assume. The challenge is, there's cases that you have in the immediate site, but the wavelength doesn't travel from point A to point C. Some, you want to drop the traffic at point B. And some, you want to pass through. You see the difference? Right? Before, if you're engineering a point to point link, you can have this, and then obviously you can put an amplifier there. But in this case, it's not an amplifier anymore, because you want to drop some traffic, and you want some traffic to pass through. Then what? Okay? It's getting tricky to design it like, like that, and I'm going to hone into the site B and show you how you can design it. So what happened is you have signal here, there's site B and the site C over here, right? So you still carry the WDM traffic, multiple signal, you demux it, because you need to drop some traffic. That's why you see the demux here, right? If you don't need to drop, it can all be an amplifier. You can pass through all traffic, right? Now, since you need to drop some, but not all traffic, then what? You're going to have, let me show you, patch through the one that you want to pass through. Right? You don't want to terminate those traffic. It's going to be a fiber patch cord from this side to that side, channel three, channel three, channel one and one, two and two. Right? The problem is when you have that, you're going to insert some in insertion loss. Remember that I said there's some loss factor in the mux demux? So when you have the signal from here, you start from zero, some fiber, 10 kilometers, ooh, 5 dB, ooh, another 5 dB, another fiber. You may not get the signal through just by patching through. So then your next option is, ah, I'm going to regen it, right? I'm going to put it so that I'll put a transponder here, just like I'm chopping this one long circuit into two short circuits, right? However, for the ones that you actually need to pass through, right? Or the one that you need, actually need to add from here to here. Remember, I've circuit from A to C and then B to C. When you add that wavelength, the power level is different, isn't it? Or you may have to fine tune this manually so that when all the signal launching from B to C, they should be all equal or level. If not, it's kind of tricky to engineer, to design it, okay? So there's some many work required. I'm not saying it cannot be done, it's just more work. Especially for many of our customers who have no optical background, okay? Who have, many of our customers today have actually have come, just have been deploying router and switches for, for all the years, right? Then how can you actually tune this? It's become a little bit daunting task, right? because you have to make sure the power is not too high, the power is not too low, power is always equal. So here's the concept of, again, this is not new, called Rodom. How many of you have heard of this term, Rodom? Good, yeah. Stand for Reconfigurable Optical and Drop Multiplexing. Yeah. What it does is that it has what it calls is WSS, or Wavelength Selective Switch. It allows you to switch, as I just mentioned, to drop, to pass through or to switch your wavelength from one to another direction to another direction. Yeah? Many of the implementation also allows you to adjust or attenuate the power. As I showed you earlier, right? if you have signal that some need to drop, some need to terminate, the power level is not equalized properly. But what it, the Rodom usually does is allows you to actually the, the module itself can actually balance the power automatically for most, if not all, of the program implementation today. Again, it's not specific to a BTI. BTI obviously can do that, but a lot of the program renders can also do that today. 
And in some implementation, the Rodom uh, module is also would combine Amplify module as well, so that it makes the the, uh, the the compensating the gain is even easier. Yeah, to make the the power balancing act is also make it easier. So this is one uh, again not specifically BTI, and the Rodom implementation just to for you to take a peek at what's inside that Rodom module. You will have Max D Max. You have wavelength coming here. You go into a, a broader module, and then you go into a WDM span. You have a pulse amplifier allows you to bump up the signal if needed. You have a receiver side. You have the amplifier as well to recover from the fiber loss. Okay, same thing on this side. So it's it's basically it. I'm just showing a point-to-point -point scenario here. What is more interesting is this one. It's what within a node. Yeah. So again, you have signal coming from here. Unlike that you would like to show you, uh, that, that I show you that you go through the max max, you patch it, and then you go through the other side, the road module allows you to express your wavelengths. Okay, if you remember my figure before, which is this one, hang on, right? You can certainly do that, right? You're basically using a patch, patch cord from point A to point B, or you go across a note, or the rotor module is just an extra module allows you to add and drop your wavelength. Give me an example, give you an example. You have four wavelengths coming here. Some can be dropped, but for the rest, you can pass through. The magic is in here. The magic is in the WSS, wavelength selective switch, right? It allows you to bounce some of the light out and pass some of the light across. Okay, and of course on this side, remember that we also need to add traffic from point B to point C. I can also add my wavelengths and continue. And everything will be equalized automatically. Does it make sense? So therefore, instead of doing this physical patch cord, you just need a single patch cord. In a sense, also a patch cord, but it's for all wavelengths. And the switch had the intelligence to steer the wavelength to drop or to pass through. That's all it is. Okay? So this is, again, this is site A, site B, and site C. So this is what's happening at site B. Okay? The other benefit of Rodham, of course, if you want to build a more mesh type network, yeah, we call this a degree. You want to expand your degree. So this is a two degree, one degree, two degree. You want to expand to the third or the fourth degree. That's how you can do it. So you in the mesh this connectivity. That means that you can have any wavelength from here. You can steer to here, here, to here, here, to here. It becomes more like an optical switch. Not quite, but it is at the wavelength level. Okay, allow you to steer the wavelength from any direction to any direction. So what, what's the big deal from a network level discussion? The big deal is if you're gonna design a network like so, right? And you want to light up these two data center with a wavelength, you can easily do that by just putting transponder here, transponder there. And over here, you want a protected wavelength, you can put a transponder here and transponder there. For the rest, it's all taken care of by the Rodom layer, meaning the wavelength will steer across the network and only drop at drop in the termination point. And for the rest, we call it OOO, optical, optical, optical transmission, as opposed to OEO, optical, electrical, optical. Okay. So the benefit of doing that is because you save all your electronics. You only place card where you need to add and drop the traffic. Obviously, where Rodham is useless is when you're going to need traffic to be terminated at every single site. There's no point of bypassing wavelength, then you don't need Rodham. Well, I mean, Rodham have other benefits too, but there's, the, the, the benefits is a lot less. If you need to terminate, you're going to put router at every single site, 
then you just hook it up as a point to point link. Right? Point to point, point to point, point to point, point to point, point to point. Right? But where you see the benefit of using the rotom technology is when you need a lot of pass through. Okay? Then it makes sense because you save all your transponder or color optics on the switches along the way. Okay? So, oop. so what I'm trying to say, one last Lego block, it's Rotom. Again, this is specific to vendors. Many of the optical vendors actually do all the Rotom technologies today. Yeah, um, and VTI is one of them. It's one of the Lego blocks that we use to build optical networks for our customers. Make sense? Perfect timing. Any questions so far? I can actually pause for two minutes or so. No? Okay, I'll keep going. So this next session, I'm gonna share some deployment, uh, uh, I'll say practical deployment uh, guideline. Uh, and two, two topics that I'm gonna to touch on, not a lot of slides, I think we may end in another 15 minutes, I don't need the whole full one and a half hours. So I'm gonna talk about this. When you're dealing with optical networks, uh, one of the things that you always get from your dark fiber provider or when you lease a, fiber, a wavelength or lease a fiber, this is something that you always encounter. It's called ODTR report, yeah? ODTL is nothing but a snapshot allows you to see your fiber, you pay what you get kind of idea. It gives you a good accurate uh, distance measurements and it's somewhat accurate at the loss profile measurements. I'm gonna talk, walk you through, you don't know what it is. Okay, it ba what it basically does, it tells you, it do a sweep if you, if you want to uh, uh, buy uh, or, or lease a 40 kilometer span, let's say, 20 kilometer span, 10 kilometer span, you'll get an ODDR reading like that, and it will show you what we call the events. These events is basically show you where the spikes may be occurring, where there's some air gaps or joints, okay? And it shows you if there's a fiber cut, if you want to identify, that can also show you where it occurs, okay? Because it basically show you, it basically send out a signal that how, how DDR works in, in, in simplest term, right? And send out these little pulses of light and it's like an echo, you bounce back because of the, of the scattering and it will actually, the light will bounce back and then on the ODDR device will receive the light and from that individual synchronized light, you can, the, the, the device can calculate the distance of this event, so when you, it's like you hit a ball to a wall, okay? If you get, you know, if you get the wall, uh, get, get the ball back within time, then you can actually calculate from the time, you, get, you can calculate the distance, and that's how you see the events are happening, yeah? So, an analogy that I always like to use, it's like building a skyscraper. What do you need? You need to know the soil. You need to know the, how, the quality of the soil, right? Of the ground. Same thing, when you build a WDM network, we talk about terabit of capacity onto a single pair of fiber. You need to know the quality of the fiber. Yeah. So the ODDR basically allows you to, to do that. <clears throat> so another example that I find, this is a, if you don't know this site, I highly recommend you bookmark this site. Very easy to read, very useful, a lot of good information about, about uh, a lot of basic optical networking, uh, optical uh, practical, uh, uh, techniques. Uh, it's called uh, Fiber Optic Association, okay? And there you can find more information, but what it's showing here, just similar to what well, this is, an actual real uh, measurements, but this is a simplified one. It shows you when you launch the signal through a launch cable, you can see, right, if there's a connector, you can see the connector where it is, the spike loss, and also fiber loss as well. So it allows you to see the picture of your actual fiber. And the things you see why it's decreasing, because this is dB per kilometers. That's your fiber loss profile, right? So it shows you the distance, it shows you the loss profile over the, your, your fiber cable under test. For more advanced reading, uh, you, obviously you can find plenty of paper in, in Google, um, and then uh, 
I find one is really good too uh, from Corning website. Again, I believe the, the presentation is uploaded in the in the uh, in the internet, right? So you can look at this, do a search on this, and then you can find a, a nice white white paper talking about this as well. Here, just showing more detailed of the uh, different kind of events that's happening, where you know of the. Uh, so you can go take a look. Number one problem that I've been hearing over and over and over again, especially for guys who come from the data world, who have been dealing with router, is the cleaning the damn fiber and the connectors. Yeah. After all, I cannot emphasize enough: we are building a skyscraper, guys. Okay. So it has to be clean. Connector has to be nice. And I w initially I wanted to bring the fiber scope to show you real life. I'm doing that. Lick on my finger or just do this, pretend I'm cleaning the fiber, you can see the difference, okay? This is not SDH, this is not Ethernet, okay? This is DWDM optical transmission. There's a proper way to clean fiber, there's a proper tool, they are not cheap, but it's definitely worth the investment because number one problem is actually dirt, believe it or not, when you, if you're, especially the first time turning up a fiber optic networks. So here is showing a scope of the picture from the fiber scope, yeah? This is not even not at that dirty, in my opinion. I run into cases as you can even see it, and it, there's no way it would work for, you know, one or two channels, okay? So you can see number one corresponding to, to a, a, a clean, nicely clean fiber connections, whereas number three, you can see, is not, not clean, and the loss that you get it can be substantial. I asked that question before, why do you care the less loss is better? Because the loss associated with the amplifying cost. Okay? So the lower the loss, the lower the cost of your network. The higher the loss, you're going to run into all kinds of problems, not only at opti optical layer, but also when you're trying to put application or you're trying to put a wavelength or circuit or giggy or whatever, right? You're going to get some bit error rate. Okay, so it just hurt the condition of your transmission. Okay, so here you just want to illustrate. Again, I would love to show you in real life because that's very, very uh, uh, visual. But in this case, I only can capture the, the picture. And today, connectors, dirt, for example, the dirt is the number one contamination, right, source of the troubleshooting, yeah. So you can see, right, when there's a light going through, ideal case, all the light going through a connection will be, most of the light should pass through. But because of this, you get some kind of back reflection. Meaning some light will pass through, and a portion of the light is actually going back towards your source. That's going to hurt your laser. That's going to impact the quality of the transmission. Yeah. So. Cannot emphasize enough, look, look it up on YouTube or whatever, right? And you see, learn how to do proper fiber cleaning. It is so, so, so important. Not only on the fiber cable, but also inside the bulkhead. This is where most of the time the dirt, the dirt uh, actually resign, okay? The fiber is easy to clean. This one, you need some, there's a lot of cool tools today that you can actually, actually poke it to clean it, right? Um, and it's definitely worth the investment. Yeah. So before you 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 try to turn up anything, uh, definitely you should try to clean. Make sure the cable is uh, is clean. Make sure the port on the max demux, the port on your transponder, the port on your amplifier are all clean. Yeah. And to do that, obviously there's tools you know, XFO, JDSU, and all kinds of plan that can, can actually is, uh, can help you to identify this. Yeah, I've been into uh, the more extreme cases when I, when I was supporting North American uh, Tier 1. Every single port, this particular service provider, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to name it, requires a picture of the, uh, to be stored in the database. So every single port that we install for them, they want a picture to make sure it's clean, a report, make sure this is matched the, 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 uh, 
they call it, but that's the, the, the extremes, right? But that being said, because of that, the, the, we ha they have had very little problems uh, with, the, with, with the troubleshooting just because of this reason. Yeah? So it's worth spending the time to make sure it's do it right. Um, I've talked about the optical uh, back uh, reflections. Again, it comes from the fact that if you have a dirty connections, okay, even though you want to transmit the light from an amplifier, let's say you like throw a ball, right? You want the ball to go through, but it bounces back. Why? Because there's some some you know uh, it's not you have an unclean interface. So then this we, this is a measurement that we use to call it is called optical back reflection. Okay, the number, the more negative, the better. It's just meaning that, that you know, in this case, if I say minus 30 dB, it's just mean that one of 10,000s of the signal will actually bounce back. As opposed to, say, minus 10, then it will be one out of uh, 10. Okay, so one tenth of the signal is actually bounce back, so that's bad. You want no black, uh, back reflection, that's the ideal case. So this number usually is as low as possible, or as negative as possible. And depending on the specs, amplifier, rotor module usually have their own threshold that if the optical back reflection is too high, meaning that you receive a lot of reflections, the device will actually will be turned off, or will not be turned up. Okay, cannot turn it up because the device itself doesn't know that whether you actually shoot a laser into open connections or it can actually damage the device by itself. Okay. So how do we clean it? Again, proper cleaning. Okay. So um, other than that, I also would like to talk about other than the, uh, the testing on the optical layer, Office, there's also testing for your signal, right? When you have, whenever, most of the time, when you turn up your optical length, everything seems proper, power, everything is good, then you're going to run some traffic on it, okay? And this is where you can do the bird testing, right? Bit error ratio testing. I think this one, I think most of the audience here would have experience in this. It's basically that you generate some random bin sequences, or p, uh, uh, p pseudo random bin sequences, uh, PRBS sequences, Sometimes from a tester, or sometimes it's actually building in the module, and that random bit sequences you're going to uh, uh, produce this sequence, and you actually go back, or sometimes loop back, and then you compare if you receive the the, the same sequences of, of one, ones and zeros. So the bit error rate is basically nothing but the number of error bits received divided by the total number of bit uh, received, right? <coughs> the error, sorry, number of error bit received and the total bit received. So in the case, let's say, for um, uh, the, for the uh, uh, transmission of uh, 10 to the minus 12, which is very common for, te for the telecom, um, the many questions that are being asked always is, how long does it take to measure the bit, the bit error rate? Usually, you run, run the bit testing overnight, of a few hours. But the, the, the number that, that we use all the time is 4.6 times to get the 99% confidence depending on, of course, depending on your bit error rate and also depending on how long you run it, right? So that's translate to basically uh, 4.6 times to 10 to the power 12 bits that you need to, at least, at the very least, you need to generate to get the measurements. Obviously, after all, this is the average number, so the longer that you do it, of course, the more confident that you know that it's, the line is, is working. On top of that, obviously, there's also layer one to layer three or layer two. Uh, this one, I think you guys would know the best, would be the RFC 2544. It's another way to test the quality of your transmission, not the transmission, but also now we talk about the, uh, the frame error ratio, the latency, the loss, the throughput. But this is obviously, it's not the optical layer anymore. It's on top of the optical layer. The, the tools that are being used all the time. So I guess I am um, uh, finish it a bit earlier, if you don't mind. So take away, quick summary. Hopefully you've learned something from this presentation. Uh, designing optical network, what I'm saying is can be easy. As 
even though you may not know optical networking uh, at all, it's actually it's not that difficult, especially in the metro, in the point-to-point -point link, it is actually very easy to engineer. <coughs> Components that I've talked about, uh, hopefully you understand now what are the Lego blocks, okay? What the Lego blocks are to build in optical networks, right? Again, from starting from the fiber, out to the mux d -mux, then you need amplifier, and then you have the transponder for the traffic, you have the mux bonder for the traffic, and if you need a more longer link, you may need DCM, okay? And then these are, I mean, if you want to build a more fancier network, ring base, mesh bay require optical bypass of the wavelengths. Rodem is another Lego block that you can use in your design. And obviously, as I said, planning tool is available for most of the, if not all, of the optical vendors <coughs> in the market. Um, yep. That's, that's all. If you have interested in other tutorial or other kind of uh, 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 seminar, feel free to contact us or me personally. Uh, it's dlearn at btisystem.com. And we also uh, have done design for low latency transmission, for example, for the high frequency trading type applications, um, uh, 100 gig uh, optical transmissions. Uh, it's another very uh, the, you know, common now. On the line side, the wavelength size, writing on a 100 gig wavelength instead of 10 gig. Data center in the connection design, and also, yeah, Metro you carry of that uh, design. That's it. Any questions? And feel free to drop by the booth just right outside. No? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Wow. Did you work for B there? Okay. So, so yes, we have a booth uh, outside, and we have actually uh, equipment of the one that I showed earlier that have uh, 100 gig and 10 gig capability designed for DCI applications. So feel free to stop by. More than happy to walk you through the specific uh, product that we have. Okay. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for bearing with me after lunch. Great to see everyone. Thank you.